Now, in order to determine rationally whether or not God exists, we need to conduct our inquiry according to the basic rules of logic. Number one, are there good reasons to think that God exists? No one's ever been able to come up with a successful argument. It's amazing. Existence of God leads to self-contradictions. But what exactly is it? Where did it all come from? And how do we get more? Energy can be neither created nor destroyed. It can only be transformed from one type to another. Albert Einstein realized that energy and matter are really the same thing, and one can be converted into the other. That's the meaning of his famous equation, E equals mc squared. These reasons are independent of one another, and taken together, they constitute a powerful cumulative case to think that he does not. This conclusion has been confirmed by remarkable discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics. Number one, then, the origin of the universe. The answer is nothing isn't nothing anymore in physics. Because of the laws of quantum mechanics and special relativity, on extremely small scales, nothing is really a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles that are popping in and out of existence in a time scale so short you can't see them. Now again, that sounds like philosophy, like counting the number of angels on the head of a pin, or religion, or something useless. I shouldn't say, Dan Dennett is here, I shouldn't say philosophy is useless, but um, <laughs> anyway, um, he's also a friend. But uh, the point is, it, we can't measure virtual particles directly, but we can measure their effects indirectly. And in fact, they're responsible for the best predictions in physics. Here, by the way, is actually a, a uh, uh, an animation that was shown at the Nobel Prize ceremonies about five years ago by a friend of mine who happened to win the Nobel Prize for, for developing the theory that produced this. This is the space inside of a proton, the empty space inside of a proton. Not where the quarks are, but the empty space between the quarks. And this is, not a, this is an animation, but it's an exact animation coming from physical calculations. This is what the space looks like. Now, how do we know that? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but one of the things are, it turns out most of the mass of the proton comes not from the quarks within a proton, but from the empty space between the quarks. These fields popping in and out of existence produce about 90% of the mass of a proton. And since protons and neutrons are the dominant stuff in your body, the empty space is responsible for 90% of your mass. So these empty space is vital to science, and these calculations are vital to understanding not just protons, but electrons and atoms, and produce the best comparisons, the, and I will repeat this, the best comparisons between theory and experiment in all of science to 10 decimal places in quantum electrodynamics using these calculations, we can get the right answer. Our new picture of cosmology is that we live in a universe dominated by nothing. The largest energy in the universe, 70% of the energy in the universe resides in empty space. If you take empty space, and that means get rid of all the particles, all the radiation, absolutely everything, so there's nothing there. If that nothing weighs something, then it contributes a term like this. This tells us that we are more insignificant than we ever imagined. <laughs> if you take the universe, everything we see, stars and galaxies and clusters, everything we see, if you get rid of it, the universe is essentially the same. We constitute a 1% bit of pollution in a universe that's 30% dark matter and 70% dark energy. We are completely irrelevant. Why such a universe in which we're so irrelevant would be made for us is beyond me. So why does the universe exist? Today we will try and paint an accurate picture of the universe based on the lambda cold dark matter model, which is the best cosmological model today. Once we have painted that picture, the answers to our questions will be straightforward. Let's assert that some kind of space-time quantum foam sort of something existed before our own universe began, before our Big Bang. Then we simply let Heisenberg's uncertainty principle go to work for us. 
If we look at the tiniest speck allowed by quantum mechanics, a small volume with a Planck length as its linear scale, the speck would have a volume of 10 to the minus 99 cubic centimeters. And the largest amount of mass, or energy, that we could put in this volume, without it becoming its own black hole, is about 1 one hundred thousandth of a gram. Interestingly, the uncertainty principle allows this much stuff to be created out of nothing for as long as 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Not a very long time, but it will prove to be enough. Because if that much energy is created in the form of a certain type of scalar field, then we have just successfully created a universe. The best model of how our early universe grew after that initial quantum fluctuation created it includes inflation, a period when the scalar field divides space into a brief period of extreme exponential expansion. During inflation, space erupted from its tiny beginnings into an unknowably huge volume. This enormous expansion generated an enormous amount of gravitational binding energy, at least 10 to the 85th grams. And this was counterbalanced by a corresponding group of positive energy in the scalar field. What began as a mere fraction of a gram of energy has now become 10 to the 85th grams. This is a huge number large enough to account for all the matter and energy that exists today. But notice that the total energy in the universe is within a quantum fluctuation of equaling zero. As a byproduct of the enormous growth of space during the inflationary period, Tiny quantum fluctuations grew into macroscopic fluctuations in the density of the scalar field, making it ever so slightly lumpy. This lumpiness provided the seeds for the formation of stars and galaxies and all the structure we see in the universe. At the end of inflation, the temperature throughout all of space was still enormously hot. But as space continued to expand, it cooled, and the energy of the scalar field, which now filled all the new and enormously huge volume of space, decayed into dark matter, and dark energy, and normal matter. The photons and quarks and electrons, which in turn settle down into the protons, neutrons, and atoms that populate the universe today. After about 380,000 years of expansion and cooling, charged particles got together to form neutral atoms. And suddenly the photons that were bumping into charged particles every second or two were free to zip unhindered across space. This is the origin of the cosmic microwave background that we see today. an uncaused, timeless, changeless, and immaterial being of unimaginable power. But surely that doesn't make sense. Now, this tends to be very awkward. What the Christian theist has always believed, the universe just popped into being uncaused out of nothing. Now, I simply put it to you. Which do you think makes more sense? That the universe came from nothing and buy nothing. I at least don't have any trouble assessing these alternatives. We can summarize our argument thus far as follows. Nothing. Remember that creationism is effectively the belief that everything came from nothing. <laughs>